If you're going to die, fight until you do. Because if you don't fight, you have no chance. I have fought for love. I'm an advocate. I respect too much the people who I am now one of those people who have been attacked in any way. You do such a disservice when you lie about things like this. The United States of America, United Kingdom and most of the Western world adhere to a very important legal principle, the presumption of innocence and the right to a fair trial. The presumption of innocence is the legal principle that one is considered innocent until proven guilty. In many countries and states, presumption of innocence is a legal right of the accused in a criminal trial and it is an international human right under the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Under the presumption of innocence, the legal burden of proof is thus on the prosecution, which must collect and present compelling evidence to the trial of fact. We are currently living in a world where some very prominent and influential people are trying to remove this basic human right which is not only in contrast to the previously mentioned law, but is deeply irresponsible, and we will set out about explaining why in this video. Let's start with Tarana Burke, social activist and community organiser and founder of the Me Too movement, who recently tweeted her insistence that we must start believing alleged victims. As commenters on Twitter rightly pointed out, this is problematic for many reasons. One, it defies law within the United States and many other countries. Two, it is deeply irresponsible to believe any and all accusations made against an individual when the evidence overwhelmingly points to a case of false accusation. Three, it encourages witch hunts and trials by media. Any reasonable person would agree that serious accusations against a person should be dealt with in a court of law and not on Twitter. Likely, when Tirana refers to the events in the news, she is talking about the alleged hate crime hoax involving Jussie Smollett, one of the strangest and biggest celebrity news stories of the year so far. On January 29, 2019, Smollett alleged that he was attacked in Chicago's Streeterville neighbourhood in what was initially investigated as a hate crime. He told police that he was attacked outside his apartment building by two white men in ski masks who called him racial and homophobic slurs and said that this is MAGA country and used their hands, feet and teeth as weapons in the assault. According to a statement released by the Chicago Police Department, the two suspects then poured an unknown liquid onto Smollett and put a noose around his neck. Smollett said that he fought them off. The police were called after 2.30 a.m. When they arrived around 2.40 a.m., Smollett had a white rope around his neck. Smollett said that the attack may have been motivated by his criticism of the Trump administration and that he believed that the alleged assault was linked to the threatening letter that was sent to him earlier that month. On January 30th, Many public figures expressed support for Smollett on social media. Entertainment industry figures and celebrities such as Shonda Rhimes and Viola Davis tweeted their outrage over the attack and support for Smollett. Democratic senators and presidential candidates Kamala Harris and Cory Booker both described the attack as a modern day lynching. The news quickly went global. It was discussed on every single major news network around the world and instantly went viral on social media platforms. People from all four corners of the earth were outraged at what appeared to be an utterly repugnant act of racism and homophobia. 
Okay, a lot to cover. We've got some breaking news. Actor and musician Jussie Smollett from the hit show Empire was attacked and beaten early this morning in Chicago. And police say it could be a hate crime. Investigators say it all started when two individuals yelled out racial and homophobic slurs. They began to beat him up and then poured a chemical substance onto his body. But it gets worse. Investigators say one of the offenders wrapped a rope around Smollett's neck. Back in 2016, Smollett spoke openly about being gay in Hollywood, telling Attitude magazine, quote, I get tired of the idea of someone telling me what my truth is. I've said from the beginning of my journey, I do not hide who I am. I love who I love. No one is going to tell me that somehow uh, that is going to be my disability. I'm told so many times that I should not walk truly in my blackness, that I should not walk truly in my sexuality. I should not walk truly in who I am. I am. I say thanks, but no thanks. F you and goodbye. I honestly think that my being, me being myself, has actually helped my career move forward. This is horrible to report. Shortly after, Smollett began to face skepticism regarding his allegations due to apparent inconsistencies in his account of the events. He responded by saying that he believed that if he had said his attackers were Mexicans, Muslims or black people, the doubters would have supported me much more. And that says a lot about the place we are in in our country right now. Smollett gave a detailed and emotional account of the alleged attack shortly thereafter to ABC News. I'm pissed off. What is it that has you so angry? Is it the the attackers? It's the is attackers, it? but it's also the attacks. It's like, you know, at first it was a thing of like, listen, if I tell the truth, then that's it, because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Then it became a thing of like, oh, how can you doubt that? Like, how do you, how do you not believe that? It's the truth. Mm -hmm. And then it became a thing of like, oh, it's not necessarily that you don't believe that this is the truth. You don't even want to see the truth. What happened that night, Jesse? When I landed in Chicago and Frank Gatson, who's like my uncle, and he's also my creative director, and he picked me up. And then we got back to the apartment. There was no food. And so I went out to Walgreens thinking that they were 24 hours and to have a smoke. <laughs> uh, Walgreens was closed. Um, so I called him up and I said, hey, I'm going to run to Subway, which was across the street, and I'm going to get a salad. Do you want anything? I went to the Subway and got the order. During that time, I texted my manager, thinking that he was still in Australia because he was on an Australian tour with one of his other clients. Mm -hmm. And I said, yo, call me when you can. He called me immediately. And while he was on the phone, I uh, heard, as I was crossing the intersection, I heard Empire. I don't answer to Empire. <laughs> My name ain't Empire. Uh, and I didn't answer. I kept walking and then I heard Empire. So I turned around and I said, did you just say to me? I and mean, I see the uh, attacker uh, masked. And he said, this MAGA country punches me right in the face. So I punched his ass back. And then um, we started tussling, you know, it was very icy and we ended up tussling by the stairs. Uh, fighting, fighting, fighting. There was a second person involved who was kicking me in my back. And uh, then it just stopped. And they ran off. And I saw where they ran. And the phone was in my pocket, but it had fallen out. And it was sitting there. And my manager was still on the phone. So I picked up the phone and I said, Brandon, and he's like, what's going on? And I said, I was just jumped. And I, then I looked down and I see that there's a rope around my neck, which I hadn't You hadn't noticed that. it before? No, you didn't because see? it was so fast. You know what I'm saying? It was so fast. How long did this all It felt take like minutes, but it probably was like 30 seconds, honestly. I can't tell you, honestly. Um, I noticed the rope around my neck and I started screaming. And I said, there's a rope around my neck. Did you get any kind of description of the attack? I gave a body description and I, you know, because I saw this, but, and you know, right here or whatever, but I didn't see, I can't tell you what color their eyes were. I can't tell you. And I did not see anything except 
the second person I saw running away. And the first person, yeah, I saw, saw his stature. I gave the description as best as I could. You have to understand also that it's Chicago in winter. People can wear ski masks and nobody's gonna question that. The police have gone through a lot of video and they were able to capture an image of two people of interest. Have you seen that image mm -hmm. and do you believe that they could possibly be the attackers? I do. What is it about their their size or what? why do you feel that they could possibly be? Because I was there. For me, when that was released, I was like, okay, we're getting somewhere. I don't have any doubt in my mind that that's them. Mm -hmm. Never did. Why did you hesitate to want to call the police? You know, there's a level of pride there. We live in a society where, as a gay man, you are considered somehow to be weak. And I'm not weak. I am not weak. And we, are, as a people, are not weak. So I, mean, I can accept that there was pride there. There's also privacy. You know, at the end of the day, look what has happened. You know, look what has happened. So I don't, I'm glad that Frank called the police. I'm glad that we reported it. Um, during that time before they came, it took them about maybe half hour to come. And during that time, I was looking at myself, just like checking myself out. I saw the bruise on my neck, you know, like the little, um, the rope burn around my neck. And then I, but I smelled bleach. I know the smell of bleach. And I saw on my sweatshirt, it had marks on it, like spots on it, when you have a bad bleach job. So then I was like, there's bleach on me too. So when the police came, um, I kept the clothes on. I kept the rope. So on. you had the rope on the entire time? I mean, it wasn't like wrapped around, but yeah, it was around because I wanted them to see. I wanted them to see what this was. Footage emerged of Smollett at his first performance since the alleged attack. Seemingly, relatively unscathed and defiantly referred to himself as the gay Tupac. Both my doctors in LA and Chicago cleared me to perform, but said to take care, obviously. And above all, I fought the fuck back. On February 13th, Chicago police raided the home of two persons of interest in the case. The men were two brothers of Nigerian descent who were paid extras on Empire, the show that Smollett stars in. Police recovered bleach and other items from the home. The brothers were held in police custody on suspicion of battery but were not charged. According to the brother's attorney, they know Smollett from working on the show and have also spent time with him at the gym. The two men were released without being charged with a crime, with Chicago police spokesman Anthony Julemy stating their release was due to new evidence from the interrogations. On February 16th, two unnamed Chicago police sources informed CNN that Chicago police had discovered evidence indicating that Smollett had paid the two brothers $3,500 to stage the attack. Financial records indicate that the brothers purchased the rope found around Smollett's neck at a hardware store in Ravenswood over the weekend of January 25th. Surveillance footage was released of the two Nigerian brothers who were seen by masks, gloves and caps hours before the alleged attack. Let's go to Tom Negevin, who's live on the north side with that story. Tom. That's right. And that part of the story, Micah and Joe, does pertain to those brothers. The Yasundero brothers have been talking to police and prosecutors at 26 and Cal, the Cook County Criminal Courthouse. We know they're there today. We know now where they were on Monday, January 28th, just hours before Jussie Smollett reported a hate crime in the Streeterville neighborhood. Take a look at the video of them on that day. 
Here in the Uptown neighborhood at a beauty supply shop, what you're seeing them purchase are a couple of balaclavas or ski masks, along with some gloves that they bought at this nondescript shop in Uptown and a red cap. Specifically, we're told by staff here, they sought out those items. They don't sell a whole lot of ski masks here, they tell me, but these two brothers seem very eager to pick them up and seemed very urgent about that. According to a store security guard, who tells me the brothers stood out in his mind, he had questions about their purchases, about what they were doing there, and, well, he believes he knows the answers now. On February 20th, Smollett was charged with a Class 4 felony for filing a false police report. Members of the LA Civil Rights Activist Group, who originally supported Smollett, distanced themselves from him and called for his arrest as the new evidence came to light. Today, Project Blind Nicole is calling upon the arrest and criminal prosecution of Empire star and actor Jesse Smollett. We believe Jesse Smollett lied about being the victim of a hate crime and being assaulted. And for us, it's a slap in the face. Justice Smollett put people's lives at risk and could have created a situation that was much, much damaging to those who are African American and those who do identify with the LGBTQ community. We have many members of the black community and the LGBTQ community who have been the victims of racism and hate crimes. So for Smollett to say that he was a victim of racism and hate crime, and we believe that it's a lie, certainly is an injustice to those true victims of racism and hate crimes, who are members of the African American community and the LGBT community. And that's why Jesse Smollett must be brought to justice for lying. At the end of the day, we believe Smollett at the beginning, we gave him the benefit of the doubt, but over the, the last few days, we've seen this campaign of lies by Smollett continue to be unraveled. And that's why we believe Smollett is lying and should be brought to justice for lying to authorities. Also, Smollett could have created a race war. There are many African Americans and many members of the LGBT community who were very upset and outraged by Smollett claiming he was attacked and victimized. So there were some in those community whose thoughts are more, more extreme, they wanted to retaliate. I'm one of the activists that call for calm and peace, and uh, we're hopeful that calm and peace will continue, but at the end of the day, Smollett claims of being abused and attacked and the victim of a hate crime and racism is nothing but a big lie. On February 21st, 2019, Smollett surrendered himself at the Chicago Police Department's central booking station. CPD spokesman Anthony Julame confirmed that Smollett was named as a suspect in a criminal investigation for filing a fake police report under a Class 4 felony. Smollett faces a maximum penalty of three you, years in prison. Not only as the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department, but also as a black man who spent his entire life living in the city of Chicago. I know the racial divide that exists here. I know how hard it's been for our city and our nation to come together. And I also know the disparities and I know the history. This announcement today recognizes that Empire actor Jesse Smollett took advantage of the pain and anger of racism to promote his career. I'm left hanging my head and asking why. Why would anyone, especially an African-American man, use the symbolism of a noose to make false accusations? How could someone look at the hatred and suffering associated with that symbol and see an opportunity to manipulate that symbol to further his own public profile? How can an individual who's been embraced by the city of Chicago turn around and slap everyone in this city in the face by making these false chart claims. Bogus police reports cause real harm. They do harm to every legitimate victim who's in need of support by police and, and investigators as well as the citizens of this city. Chicago hosts one of the largest pride parades in the world 
and we're proud of that as a police department and also as a city. We do not, nor will we ever tolerate hate in our city, whether that hate is based on an individual's sexual orientation, race, or anything else. So I'm offended by what's happened, and I'm also angry. I love the city of Chicago and the Chicago Police Department, warts and all. But this publicity stunt was a scar that Chicago didn't earn and certainly didn't deserve. To make things worse, the accusations within this phony attack received national attention for weeks. Celebrities, news commentators, and even presidential candidates weighed in on something that was choreographed by an actor. First, Smollett attempted to gain attention by sending a false letter that relied on racial, homophobic, and political language. When that didn't work, Smollett paid $3,500 to stage this attack and drag Chicago's reputation through the mud in the process. And why? This stunt was orchestrated by Smollett because he was dissatisfied with his salary. So he concocted a story about being attacked. Now our city has problems, we know that. We have problems that have affected people from all walks of life, and we know that. But to put the national spotlight on Chicago for something that is both egregious and untrue is simply shameful. Despite the heavy evidence currently against Smollett, it is important to note that we do still believe in the presumption of his innocence and a fair trial, and that applies to Jussie as well. But at the same time we ask, is it reasonable that two presumably innocent men were, by many, immediately believed to be guilty at the word of one man, who had, according to the police, a financial motive to lie? Had the surveillance evidence not been found, would those two men or two other innocent men be deemed to be guilty? While you ponder the wider implications of such dangerous reasoning, let's take another look at Tarana's reaction to the story. It is rather strange that the founder of Me Too would continue to blindly believe any and all accusations especially since former Me Too leader Asia Argento has been accused of sexually assaulting actor Jimmy Bennett in 2013 when he was 17 and she was 37. Argento had first met Bennett when he played Argento's son in the 2004 film The Heart is Deceitful Above All Things when Bennett was 7 years old. The alleged assault occurred in 2013 when he was only two months past his 17th birthday and she was 37 in a hotel room in California where the age of consent is 18. According to Bennett, in their encounter Argento gave him alcohol, performed oral sex on him and engaged him in sexual intercourse. The actress had quietly arranged a $380,000 non-disclosure settlement with him in the months following her accusations of sexual assault towards Harvey Weinstein. Argento denied the allegations, claiming that she had never had a sexual encounter with Bennett and explained the settlement to the alleged victim by claiming that her partner, Anthony Bourdain, paid him to avoid negative publicity. Following Argento's denials, a photograph of her topless in bed with Bennett was published, as well as her alleged admission of sex with him in text messages to Rain Dove. In a letter published online in September 2018, Argento's attorneys admits there was a sexual encounter, but claims that Bennett sexually attacked Argento. After increasing outrage at the blatant hypocrisy of the Me Too movement, Tirana finally weighed in on the issue. Tirana finally acknowledged that men too can be victims of sexual crimes in a series of tweets that were considered by many too little too late. As many people have pointed out to Tirana, 
The presumption of guilt despite evidence is exactly this type of thinking that is extremely dangerous and has directly resulted in people such as Emmett Till's murder. Emmett Till was born July 25th, 1941, born and raised in Chicago. During his summer vacation in 1955, at the age of 14, he was visiting relatives in the Mississippi Delta region. He spoke to 21-year-old Caroline Bryant, the white married proprietor of a small grocery store there. Till was accused of flirting with or whistling at Bryant. In 1955, Caroline Bryant testified that Till made physical and verbal advances. Several nights later, Bryant's husband Roy and his half-brother J.W. Millam went armed to Emmett's great-uncle's house and abducted the boy. They took him away and beat him and mutilated him before shooting him in the head and sinking his body into the Talachi River. Three days later, Till's body was discovered and retrieved from the river. Till's body was returned to Chicago where his mother insisted on a public funeral service with an open casket. The open coffin funeral that was held exposed the world to more than her son Emmett Till's bloated, mutilated body. In September 1955, Bryant and Milan were acquitted of Till's kidnapping and murder. Protected against double jeopardy, the two men publicly admitted in a 1956 interview with Look magazine that they had killed Till. Decades later, Mrs Bryant disclosed that she had fabricated part of the testimony regarding her interaction with Till, specifically the portion where she accused Till of grabbing her waist and uttering obscenities. That part's not true, Bryant stated in a 2008 interview with the historian Timothy Tyson. You might be thinking, thank goodness we have moved on since those days, and I would agree that many improvements have been made in our society since the 1950s, particularly regarding the civil rights movement. But Tarana Burke and many others are forcing us back into an era where evidence and facts are disregarded to make way for slander, character assassination and witch hunts. Tarana has openly congratulated Dan Reid, the director of Leaving Neverland, and offered her support to accusers Wade Robson and James Safechuck, who allege that Michael Jackson sexually abused them as children. Despite the many inconsistencies in Robson's and Safechuck's stories that we have detailed for you in our previous videos, Despite the fact that Michael Jackson was acquitted during a criminal trial on all 14 counts in his lifetime. Despite the fact that Michael Jackson was investigated covertly for years by the FBI, who found no incriminating evidence despite all efforts to do so. Despite the fact that Robson testified during 2005 in defence of Jackson, who later said that he did not realise as an adult that the alleged rape by Jackson was abuse at the time. And despite suing the estate of Michael Jackson only when he was turned down for a lead role in an MJ Cirque du Soleil tribute show. Despite Safechuck's graphic allegations of abuse eerily echoing the fictitious book of Victor Gutierrez called Michael Jackson Was My Lover, who was successfully sued by Jackson and was ordered to pay him £2.7 million in damages. Despite both accusers' cases being thrown out of court. Despite all of this, Tarana chooses to put her faith in two known liars who have a huge financial motive instead of carefully examining the evidence in order to reach a reasonable conclusion. Tarana is not alone in holding this troubling ideology of abandoning facts and reason to make an informed decision. Currently, in most states in the US and in the UK, there is no law to protect the deceased from libel or defamation. So, the media are free to run any and every story about Michael Jackson and any other deceased person that they please, regardless of the accuracy. It is entirely forgivable that people might give abuse accusers the benefit of the doubt when telling stories of abuse. 
but should the same courtesy not be given to the accused? Is it not reasonable to look at both sides and to make an informed decision based on evidence? Should we not demand that journalists, politicians and leaders approach such allegations with a balanced and fair view? Or should we remove the judicial process entirely and replace it with trial by media? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Now the plot to destroy Michael Jackson, another young boy coming forward with allegations he was molested by the superstar. But when our Diane Diamond began to investigate, she uncovered a trail of lies. Diane? Terry, ever since the Michael Jackson child molestation scandal broke, we've gotten a constant stream of calls and letters from people making dubious claims about the singer. Frankly, we ignore most of them. But when I heard the facts of this story, I just had to go to Canada and check it out myself. And I'd like to make a confession about something that happened between me and Michael Jackson. He is only 15 years old, so we can't show you his face or let you hear his real name. But the 11-minute home video he sent hard copy several weeks ago could have become Michael Jackson's worst nightmare. Looking straight into the camera, using no notes, this boy proceeded to tell us in graphic detail how he and another teen were allegedly molested by the superstar. He started just touching like our stomach and things like he'd rub our stomach and then he'd, he'd get lower and then that's when I started saying like, what are you doing? He said, it's okay, don't worry, the bodies are meant to be touched. But the boy wasn't acting on his own, he had help. A man who identified himself as John Templeton of Mississauga, Canada. That's a suburb of Toronto. He sent us the boy's videotape statement and even called several times to make sure we looked at it. Then, I got a call from the boy himself. Diane Diamond. Over the next few days, I spoke with the boy for hours, and he never wavered. His story stayed consistent. The boy said he met Michael Jackson at a Canadian video arcade. He said he was supposed to spend the weekend with a friend, but when Jackson invited him to visit Neverland instead, off they flew in a private jet. This 15-year-old described in detail the people in Jackson's entourage, the layout of the ranch, and even Jackson's family home at Encino. Later, he would draw us incredibly detailed maps of both Jackson homes. It was clear either the boy was telling the truth or he had been well coached. To get to the bottom of it, I agreed to meet the boy and John Templeton in Toronto. The plan was to meet the pair in the lobby of an airport hotel, but when I arrived, the only one to greet me was the young boy. He came with me into town and told me that he lived on the streets of Toronto, in a section called Boys Town, where the street kids gather. He explained that his mother had kicked him out of the house, and that John Templeton was just a man he'd met on the street. He kind of helps the street kids, like just talks to them and things, like got a, sort of like the guidance counselor of the street that's what it seemed like the boy appeared to be on his own there was no sign of john templeton and frankly that seemed suspicious but over the next few days a hard copy team conducted hours of interviews with the boy standing by were police officials in both california and toronto they were waiting to conduct their own investigation of the boy's charges Hi, my name is Frank Grimes. I work for the TV show Hard Copy. Producer Frank Grimes and I worked to check out countless pieces of information the boy gave us. While sources were able to confirm much of what he said, there were some troubling inconsistencies. Still, the boy stubbornly stuck by his story, and he had an incredible knowledge of Michael Jackson's lifestyle. He showed me this place like a saddle shop where he said he, he, said he gets stuff for his animals there. I don't know what he got, but... I guess that'll shop. I see that on your map here. Yeah. People are going to think that you're out for his money. I don't care what he's saying. They're going to think yeah, you're making it up. Yeah, no, no, I don't care about his money. You can keep it. You tell him the absolute truth. Yeah. He talked for hours, and he knew so much. So much, in fact, that we thought, well, let's give him a test. You know, to see if we could trip him up. We showed the boy several photographs. Some of them were of Neverland employees, and he was able to identify each and every one of them. Yeah, that's him. We almost put that. That's him. 
If this was a scam, this boy had really done his homework. He even went so far as to draw us a picture of what he said Michael Jackson looked like during the alleged molestation. Always, he came back to his claims of molestation. His eyes are big and they're, they're dark. They cavern and like, the sockets to go right in, you know? But there was one thing I didn't tell the boy. I didn't tell him that for the last year, I've been getting Michael Jackson-related letters from his same small suburb in Canada. The letters were supposedly from other young boys who also claimed that they had been molested by Jackson. Two of the letters even included pictures of the boys. Well, someone was behind all this, but still, there was no sign of the man who'd sent us the original video statement of the boy. No sign of John Templeton. There's a Detective Campbell downtown. He doesn't know your name. He doesn't know anything yet. Okay. But he's waiting to see us. Want to go? Yeah. From the very beginning, the boy never asked us for money, and he repeatedly said he didn't want any money from Michael Jackson either. So what was his motivation? Well, he said it was simple. He said he wanted justice. And now he was about to give a sworn statement to the police. I want you to remember one thing. Just tell them the truth. Go ahead. We delivered the boy to the Toronto Metro Police Headquarters, where detectives from the sexual assault unit had been waiting for us. I understand you want to speak to me, and that's okay. We're going to uh, go upstairs and get yeah. to talk to me. Okay. Okay? Yeah. For six solid hours, police questioned the boy, took his sworn statement. He told them just what he'd told us, that superstar Michael Jackson had molested him. I found a fairly believable thing. While the boy talked with police, we continued our investigation. We had to find this John Templeton. So we drove out to the Toronto suburbs to check out the return address from the videotape he'd sent us. That's when we ran into somebody we knew. What the hell is going on? Okay, Diane, let me explain something to you. Say hello to John Templeton, only his real name is Rodney Allen. We've known about Rodney for a long time. Right after the Michael Jackson scandal first broke, he was on the phone to us claiming that another Jackson family member had molested him years ago. Rodney has never offered any solid proof of this claim. He appeared to be a man bent on revenge. And Rodney admitted he was the one who'd been writing me all those letters. I care about this one kid who gave me all sorts of information about Neverland, about Havenhurst, about Disneyland, about Michael Jackson's body. Where did he get all that information? He got it from me. You planted all this stuff I in this kid's head. I didn't, I didn't find it in his head. He was asking questions. I answered them as best I can. I told him what I could tell about the place. Because I, I want Michael to face it. So this kid is a A1, number one liar. The whole story was a scam. A Toronto street kid meets a man obsessed with the Michael Jackson case, and the result could have been an international scandal. Meanwhile, back at the police station, the boy finally broke down. He admitted that he and Rodney Allen had made up the whole story. The young boy was lying. Um, that's my belief, and, then, and as a result of that, he was charged, yes. Can you tell us what he was charged with? Uh, public mischief. Well, the boy is still in custody tonight, and police continue their investigation of Mr. Rodney Allen. Barry? Thanks, Diane. What an incredible scheme.